Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. Uh, we're going to be now, before we get started, we are going to talk about chapter two of The Other West More tonight, and that'll be the topic of most of the show. But Dana, my dear, my friend. Oh, wait, uh, there's more. Yes, people are still, and when I say people, I mean some random geek, but he's people. And also and also <laughs> Sarah, person. Sarah Scott. He counts. Uh, 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 he uh. does count. Ah, one, two people arguing in the comments. Ah, <laughs> That's ah, all. Ah. There's probably but, more. <laughs> yeah, probably more. But but people are talking about the, the stream we did on Wednesday, which was our Trek Reluctantly stream, where uh, we watched the episode uh, progress of deep space nine and then had a nice discussion slash argument about uh Mullabot. In which you were wrong Steve. <laughs> according to you which you know uh <laughs> oh. <laughs> according, and not just you according to uh, there were a lot of people in the chat that, that were that agreed with you according to um, millions and millions of people are you the rock now the millions <laughs> Um, I was trying to go for Trump, but like I literally have not watched him talk enough to do an impression of Trump. Yeah, I'm just you know I I have that you know that now that's one great thing about how teaching takes over your life is you can just avoid a terrible president. Yeah, <laughs> you just you get like I I I got shit to do. Sorry, <laughs> just not listen um, to it. But yeah, so. So we were we were arguing about Mullabach, who is the guy who sort of the last holdout who refused to leave when the government cleared everybody out of, of, of a moon. It was basically it's like an eminent domain sort of slash forced relocation argument, you know, like. Uh, yes, actually, I think I'm pointing the wrong way. If it's actually on my screen, it would be over here. There's some random geek. It doesn't matter what his name was. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah, just like blending things together as as the and that level of analysis there, the, the connection between ideas. As yes. an English teacher, I am just like oh. Yes, absolutely. To to use an academic term, the synthesis. Oh nerd. Thank you. Thank that, you. Using using your your uh your 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 English language uh, acquisition vocab your 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 academic vocabulary. <laughs> Radical Bacon asks, "Can moderators do stuff to other moderators?" I think that is a consent issue best best settled between the moderators. I mean, it's you know, really... yeah. I mean, I'm I'm perfectly fine with it. No king yeah. shaming here. No, absolutely. Um... <laughs> yeah, it has nothing to do with me. Work it out amongst yes, yourselves. Consent is key. Everybody. Yes, it's but so... um. But yeah, uh, and by the way, Sarah, I, I uh, Andrew messaged me and I got his uh, YouTube uh, page link and I tried to unblock him and it wouldn't let me unblock him for some reason. I think there might be a glitch or something that's stopping me from unblocking him. So I am still working to to unblock him, but maybe he hasn't like, been unblocked maybe yet. Maybe he's like a super troll like somewhere else and he's like YouTube banned. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, his page is still there. I can I can press. What happened is I press the the button that lets you unblock someone, and it never it just never changes. It stays. It 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 never unblocks them. It just you know. So wow, I don't know. I'm, but uh, but but I'm 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 trying my best to to clear the block. Hey, but anyway, Pedro, I hope you're feeling okay. Well, so we talked like you know that this week and kind of the what. what the what what I realized, which I had before, is we're starting from a different premise. Which you're starting from the premise that Mullabach has to has to leave. Like he's got he he's got to go. And yes. the show is about Kira having to deal with the fact that she's the one who has to make him go. And it's not like the idea that Mullabach has the option to not leave is like not part of your starting equation. And I'm just like, right. oh, okay. That's very different from the way that I saw the show. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah, I think, yeah, you were. <laughs> I love Sarah's comment. Hey, he's been blocked for about five years. Don't worry about it. He's probably a jerk. <laughs> he's not that much of a jerk. He's a patron. So, you know. <laughs> okay, okay. So the shut up, Sarah. Helps. He's a pay. Don't you talk about my patrons that way? Okay, um, Trump. Yeah, he's giving me money. He's terrific. <laughs> see, see, you can do it, Steve. You can do it. And you know why? It's because of those, um, the, those uh, 
face palm five video she did. Yeah, exactly. So much of that was it's, Trump. Like, I don't Trump know. Trump had his own section. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who you're talking about. I'm not familiar with him, but I understand he likes me very much. So, like, that's kind of Trump, you know. But, um, but well, I also want to bring up, and Dana, I want, I want to, you know, you can chime in on this too, because what, what got me to think about it as far as talking about it tonight, because you and I talked about it privately yesterday. And, and um, I think that was one of the first things you told me when we talked yesterday for the first time. You said, okay, I've decided it was a bad episode. And then you went into your, your <laughs> here's, reasoning. And here's why. And um, you're just like, yeah, I, I, none of that bothered me because I just took all of that, you know, essentially I was starting from a different point. Yeah, but yeah. I, I want to point out Pedro in the chat yes. is saying that he didn't get COVID. Oh, he's awesome. Really, really, he's really, 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 really sick. So that's not great. But, but not COVID. Yeah. He doesn't have to uh, to quarantine from his his little girl. That's wonderful. From his That's daughter. such good news. I that... I really yeah. I hope you feel better soon, Pedro. I really do. Yeah. I'm sorry that you feel badly, but I, I'm glad that I'm it's so not. I'm so glad. Going. Yay! I'm so yeah. glad. I'm so glad that you you first of all that you have family that you want to spend time with. That's also <laughs> a plus. <laughs> you weren't like hoping for the quarantine order. Like, come on, God, two uh, weeks, you know, I can't please. Stand living with these people, can we? Yeah. But, but yeah, um, hey, yeah. that's just that's great. Uh, but yeah, so but so the idea that you're, you're, I mean, all all of the information that I'm just like, you know, um, uh, I think Sarah, you mentioned in the chat, or, or or someone mentioned in the chat, you know, that that essentially, you know, he could be keeping, um, uh, he could be holding the welfare of millions, you know, yeah. in his revolutionary hands. And I was like, I didn't think they said millions, but you know, the the number, the, the a whole lot of people, a lot of people, you know. Yeah needs of the many and all that you know Indeed. i know that's a star trek thing it sure is uh eh? and um but and then you know exactly you know first of all what kind of welfare are we talking about don't know you know the, the, the point i brought up that you know we'd be able to survive down here in georgia was not to necessarily say that the Bajorans could survive it's that we don't know we don't yeah. we literally have no idea how bad it's been no idea or how bad it's likely to be you know that it, it just it just glosses over that or, or, or it goes right past it. It just doesn't even bother. And I mean, there were a number of things that, you know, I complained about that I'm like, I have problems with this, 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 this. And they just, they just, you know, all of these things could have been um, addressed pretty easily and they just didn't bother. And I see that as lazy writing. And you're like, well, that's because I don't think that that's what was the point of the episode. And I will grant you that if they wanted us to focus on Kira's reaction. I, I I think you could argue that spending too much time on the situation and why it was, how it had developed into where it was, could distract from that. But the fact that they don't set it up authentically, to me, makes it feel like the whole Kira thing is simply is is emotionally manipulative and i don't care about her reaction because you know it, it seems it's it hasn't been adequately justified yeah and you're because we also talked about um dark knight returns and how i'm right. just like no it sucks right yeah i was i was I, i'm glad you said that because i was going to go into that next which is part of part of it is yeah that we we were we were we were coming at it from different starting points or from mm -hmm. you know from different points of view and the and, but another part of it is that this there i mean we're we're really really alike in a lot of ways but one of the ways in which we're different is totally. that <laughs> one of the ways in which we're different is that um you know you i i think you tend to be much more interested um and to gravitate a lot more strongly toward details in stories that i just don't need or I, you know, or that I'm not interested in. Right. So like when you were saying about how, like, you need to know, like, what, what are the options and how many pe how many people are we talking about? Hundreds of thousands, millions, like how bad is the winter going to be, et cetera, et cetera. Like it wasn't just that I didn't think that was relevant to the premise of the episode. It's also that those kind of details, like my, my threshold for how much information do I need to care about this story, I think is a lot lower than yours. It's not that I don't need any details or I don't need, but it's just, well, you have I, to be able to understand what the heck's going on. Yeah. I mean, there's a, oh yeah. Stuff. Yeah. There, and you, yeah. But yeah. And, and also like you said with the dark Knight returns, 
you know, you you reject the premise of the story. So you just you, you're just not you're, you're not on board for the story from the beginning because you're like, nope, I don't buy the premise. That wouldn't happen. I'm not interested. And and I'm more the type of person that says, well, OK, that doesn't match my take on the character. Like if I were writing Batman, I probably wouldn't have him, you know, be retired for 10 years. I just that doesn't match my view of his character but obviously someone else has a different take let me see what they said let me see you know let me let me read the story and see where it goes so i'm you know it's sort of and i guess i guess some of that is just because i'm just i'm i'm a very i i have to be uh very because there's so much stuff that i want to read i just i'm very (laughs) Very selective yeah like i am fine like that's why, that's why the stupid Pride and Prejudice thing is so hard. It's so hard, you guys, because I can't just quit. And I'm so, oh, God, I'm so close to the end. I'm so close. I got I got the, the video that went up yesterday. I got two more. Mm-hmm. That's all I got. I got two more. And then I'm done with that sucker. I'm so ready to be done with that sucker. Ugh. Yeah. Um, I want to mention- And I mean, any other book, I'm just like, I'm fine. It's, it's fine. You know, I'll just, you know, like, if it doesn't grab me, um, I don't keep reading it. <laughs> and there are so many people in my life who are not like that. So my, my brother, my younger brother, he is like, he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish reading them. I'm, I'm hating this, but I've got to finish it because I start, I'm like, you started reading it. You are capable of stopping reading it. Okay. But yeah. like with, 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 with Batman, you're like, you know, I, somebody else might see it differently. You know, I'll, I'll see where that goes. If I could... Like if it wasn't Batman, and for for me, I pick it up. I'm like, oh, he retired. He just he just decided to quit. The way I do with books, that's not <laughs> Batman. I'm like, you know, yeah. I don't know. Make it about. Uh, I don't know who's a good character, who's a quitter. I don't know. Make it about the Joker. Oh, like like you're. Do- oh my God, like you're. Well, I was talking about, you about that- Harley Quinn. Yeah. Yes, like what you're saying. Like she she got him dropped in. Am I allowed to say that? Is yeah. that a, a spoiler? Uh, well, spoiler? Spoilers for Harley Quinn. If anybody hasn't watched it, then you don't want to know what happens, but okay. Okay, so plug your ears, and I'll give you a thumbs up when I'm done talking about that. But yeah, apparently she drops him on either the same vat of acid, and it works backward this time, or a vat of different acid. A, I think it's like, different acid, but yeah, it, it, yeah, okay. it, it reverses. And, uh, his, and, and it yeah. like reverses everything and wipes his memory, so he has no idea that he ever was the Joker, and he becomes this, you know, sort of, he becomes this guy, just, just, just some dude. Yeah. Just some dude, which, you know, Steve, as you pointed out, just seems like, you know, him being so egotistical seems like the perfect revenge for him. He just doesn't realize that it's, <laughs> that there's any kind yeah. of punishment involved. He's, he apparently is completely happy being just some dude because he doesn't know. Because he's, he's, yeah, he's oblivious to his past. Yeah. Um, oh, so. I, I do want to, before, before, before we move on and start talking about the book, I do want to point out, because some random geek is actually who. Yeah, wait, uh, wait. I need to do this to show the spoilers are over. Spoilers oh, yeah. Are spo- over. Yeah, spoilers. Okay, so, Harley Quinn spoilers are over. pointed out yeah. something. Yeah, Harley Quinn spoilers are over. Um, but yeah, some random geek w- uh, pointed out at the, at, in the live chat before we even went on the air. Um, that, that, that is what made me, you know, ask you if we could talk about this a little bit more on this stream. Uh, some points about. The situation in the episode and what Mullabach was doing and and whether it's right or wrong for the state to force a person to move even if it's for something that would benefit a large group of people um and there's a couple of his comments i want to single out one of them is um i agree one man's stubbornness shouldn't hold up a project that would benefit hundreds of thousands of bajarans so they don't freeze to death what i am not so certain of is if he should be teleported away against his will. If he is willing to die to stay on his farm, it's hard for me to say, you don't know what you're talking about, you're leaving, like it or not, because that is very authoritarian. And that sounds a lot like kind of about, a lot like what you were saying, Dana, Um, which is, hey, if, if he won't leave and he wants to die, if that's his choice and he's capable of making that choice, you know, and if he's like a rational person, uh, then, and then, of course, who gets to decide that as well? Yeah, yeah. But and and I, so I wanted I wanted to point that out. And uh, but see, the I don't think that is really the the most pertinent question, right? Um, 
because some random geek says uh like who he says who says that he is wrong for being willing to die that is the question and and i mean maybe that's the question for geek maybe that's the question for other people that 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 come at this issue but for me that's not really what i'm primarily concerned about i mean because and, and it was also brought up like you know people have uh do not resuscitate orders uh mm -hmm. people can you know can commit suicide themselves or have you know in some jurisdictions there is there is a legal that's allowance awesome. for assisted suicide so and and you know there's and you brought up bodily autonomy a couple of times too and so did some other people and you know and i'm i'm not against any of that my problem is it's it's one thing to say you have the right to decide to end your own life you know that that you should have that ability and and if you can find another person who is willing to help you do that 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 should be okay too right i i'm i'm totally on board with all of that but it's it's the issue of do you have the right to force someone else to kill you if you know what i mean and i feel like that's and and that is kind of what the situation would be if Mullabach stayed behind and the Bajaran government said, OK, you know what? Screw him. If he doesn't want to leave, we're not going to we're not going to move him against his will. We'll leave him there and we'll just do what we need to do. And he can just die like he wants to. Um, you're basically putting the government in a position where they're going to be where you know, if if moving you is now off the table for whatever reason, they're going to be forced to kill you. You're forcing, you're not just forcing another person, you're forcing a government to kill you, which is, is another layer that is troubling to me. Cause I just, you know, it's, it's one thing to say you should be able to, you know, Make choice for yourself. Yeah. It's one. Yeah. And, and, and cause like, and, and, okay. Going, yeah. going, going literary on who Go here, ahead. it is, there's a, a difference, um, in, uh, Julius Shakespeare's version of Julius, Julius Caesar. There's a difference in how they die at the end. Um, they both ask someone to help them. And um, Joe, I do want to talk about those two things. Uh, we'll eventually get to the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get to the book soon here because um, we have an activity. So we do we have the activity yeah if you haven't found your lists and you can you can do so you know or if you just were like i don't care about this don't forget to get your your surveys out from last time so anyway um cassius uh because of what goes on he asks he, he tells his slave he says i'm going to take take my sword and when i've covered my face with my cloak as i have now um stab me you know kill yeah. me and brutus uh asks each of his soldiers who are under his command but apparently he asks them um because the only question the only one that we get to to hear that conversation he he takes uh volumnius and dardanius aside and uh i'm kind of surprised because i haven't gotten to teach this in a while because it's got it's it's, it's what's gotten um tanked so that i could i uh, spend more time with research um and then last spring i think that was what we were doing next and it's like surprise we're not going back to school haha <laughs> yeah so volumnius and dardanius he takes and and has a private conversation that the audience does not hear and then they come back and said what did he ask you to and and uh or or at least the first one says no my lord that's not an office for a friend and uh you know so they both they both say what did he ask you to do and he's like to kill him did he ask the same thing to you yeah what the heck and then so anyway he goes over and says Strato, you've been asleep this whole time. Um, but um, I wanted to ask you something. So he's like, sure, dude, what? <laughs> and, um, you know, yes, I, I greatly respect you. And he says, um, my life is near its end. He's like, no, my Lord. And I am I can tell, look, all I want you to do is hold my sword while I run on it. Will you do that for me? And he says, you know, that that's not an offer for a friend. He says... You know, I just, I don't want to be taken prisoner. And that's my other option. And he says, you know, will you, will you let me have an honorable death? And he's like, well, give me your hand first, my Lord. And they shake hands and then Brutus, Brutus does it to himself, even though he has, but he has someone helping him, yeah. but it, he's much more in charge of it. And I think all of that is deliberate. Um, yeah. Cassius's slave, um, he, who was, you know, essentially like a prisoner of war type 
slave. Yeah. Um, says, and now I had, I am free. Yet if I had had my own will, I would not be. He's like, and you know, kind of yeah. didn't want to just murder somebody in order to do it, even though they told me it was okay. Um, which is just interesting. Um, so you know that the level of how much you are in control, how much the person is in control of what happens is, you know, is, is something that, that goes into the legal issue of, you know, assistance yeah. as well. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a, I think there's, there's, a, there's a very important distinction between having the right to have someone assist you in ending your life, which I do think is a right people should have, and having the right to demand that any given person assist you. Like, I don't think you have that right. If you can persuade another person to help you, mm -hmm. you should be able to do that without any punishment from the government. Like that should just be something that is allowed. It's, you know, I, it's, it's sad and it's tragic, but if that is the situation and that's what you want to do and you have a friend who's willing or a doctor or whoever is willing to help you, uh, you should be allowed to do that, but you shouldn't be able to demand that someone else do that whether they want to or not. Yeah, you shouldn't um, be able to force them to do it against their will. Right, role. right. Or, or you know, contrive a scenario <laughs> where, like, it's an impossible choice and, you know, like, one of two horrible things will happen and one of them is that they can kill you, you know, like, which is kind of the Mullabach situation. It's like, either if, if he stays and they decide for whatever reason that they can't or they won't just move him, then either they don't do the project and Bajor misses out on this, all this energy that it needs, or the government kills a guy, yeah. you know, for no reason other than he just didn't want to leave. And those are both terrible options. And they're in that situation because <laughs> he won't leave. And because again, for whatever it may, you know, um, how geek always says, or has been saying repeatedly, like, well, if they move him, it's authoritarian. So if that, and if, if that is the decision that the government makes, if they say, oh, well, you know, no matter what, we can't just take him against his will, then they take that off the table. Then their two remaining awful options are either we don't do the thing or we kill the guy. But again, you're, 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 you're starting from the premise that it's, it's an awful option. Um, yeah. Joe, uh, I, I want to address two of Joe's comments, yeah. um, that, that it's part of his job to stop people from doing those things. Um, and it's, you know, I can, I can definitely, I'm curious, I'm, I'm curious about that because, you know, there are, you know, at, there are people who physically who will go in and, and try, you know, you know, you're in a, a different dangerous situation and will physically stop them but at the same time there are also um state hotlines so i'm not entirely sure um what it is but if somebody calls a hotline it's because they you know they want help so i'm um, it, it kind of depends on you know what the, what the job is and, and how much how much force you've got to use and then you you also asked will you be proud that you got through it will you be prejudiced against her other novels um I'll be relieved, I think, more than, and I think I will have a sense of accomplishment when I finish the stream and the video goes live and they're all, they're all up there. I like that sense of, I do like that sense of, yay, it's, it's awesome. It's done. I was, uh, when, when I finally got to the point that all I had enough, I think I'm, I think I have enough um, writing lesson videos that when I look at, it, it's so, it's so, not, it's not completely pointless, but it's very close um, that I, that, that my playlists when you go to my youtube page that they all filled the screen and it was all nice and like filled in yeah. all the blocks were filled in i'm like yay <laughs> so, so that, silly. Was, I feel that was you know i had a sense there's that sense of completion so definitely once the, the, once the playlist is complete and they're all up there um i will i will have a sense i will i will be proud of that as far as being prejudiced against her other novels no I will be informed about, I will be better informed about making decisions about whether or not I want to read them. <laughs> I don't think that counts as, I mean, that's certainly, if anything, that's less prejudice. Yeah. You know, I have more like reasonable judgment. Um, uh, I, I, well, I, I, I don't think I would be less likely to read them than I was before because I was less likely to read them than, say, her other novels. Um, 
mostly because I have other stuff that I really, really want to read. And there's a lot of it. Like right now I am working on uh, the years that matter most, uh, how college makes or breaks us, which is interesting. There are some points that I, you know, that, that, that he, he seems to be assuming some points, Steve, um, that I'm Indeed. just like, I'm not necessarily willing to concede. Like he talks about the data that shows that um, when you go to a more selective school with a higher average essay, you know, freshman SAT level, you students, students who graduate from that school make more money. And uh, regardless of their family income beforehand, and that there is still a disparity between students from wealthy families and students from le uh, poor families, um, but it's, it's, you know, and it's statistically significant, but I mean, it's not as much of a disparity as you think, and it's not as much of a disparity as an academically similar student who goes to a less selective university, both from richer and poorer students. Um, richer and poorer families and the disparity in wealth of those students. So, I mean, they were literally able to pull um, generational data. Um, but at the same time, I'm just like, there's more to life than how much money you make. Yeah. Cause I mean, they're talking about the difference between like making 75,000 and, uh, you know, going to this and the median being 75,000 and 88,000. I'm like, yeah, those are both like comfortable incomes. Right. There, there can't be that big of a difference. There, there really isn't. Yeah. And not only that, but like they're both in that you're making plenty, you know. Yeah. And it's similar. And I'm just like, the, yeah, oh boy, there's just like that so much. So I will be really interested to see where he goes with this. Because what I thought he was going to be talking about is, you know, students who, who, you know, decide to go to college and then don't follow through and how that you know how that experience impacts them so i mean and i'm not that you know i'm uh, this far into it now so i'm not that yeah. far so he may go there he may not but it's been really interesting and then the next one is going to be uh the body keeps the score um and this is about how um the the like mental illness is a there is a physical component to mental illness but the way that experiencing trauma and mental illness itself is not the only result um, that, that it affects the rest of our body as well. And it's, you know, it's literally the body keeps the score. The yeah. body, you know, the, the lower part of your body um, also remembers your trauma. It's not necessarily just about um, anxiety or depression or post-traumatic stress or things like that. Those are, those are physical resp physiological responses too, but those are just sort of the ones that are those are the only things that we tend to connect with trauma, but there are other very uh, nor normal, typical physiological responses that are a yeah. result of that as well. So, yeah, so, and then and then there's just more. I've got two more that are en route through interlibrary loan, uh, <laughs> and the summer is coming up. So let me tell you, there will be reading happening. <laughs> so oh, speaking of reading, and speaking of books. Of Shall we yes. talk about the other Westmore? And do, so do you want to start with uh, talking about uh, yes. the Likert scale? Let's talk about, let's talk about the survey. So I really hope that everybody has, oh, oh, and let me find, where did I put those papers? Yeah. Let me find the results. I got some of my students' results. Because you have illustrations. You have props. I have, I have visual aids. Ah. I'm so excited, you guys. I'm so excited. Okay. All right. Let's go. So um, the first so yeah, oh, you're, oh, you're, Charles. oh, and Charles, I'm so glad you made it. And I'm so glad that you were helping out a student. It's called the body keeps the score. Um, and, um, I can put it in a comment later. Um, and it's by Bessel van der Kolk. It sounds very, very, very Dutch. Um, <laughs> very Dutch. Um, the body keeps the score. Yes, Charles. Um, so the, the first statement was, um, Yes. Will you read it for us because you're putting it up? I it's up on the screen now. So this, so these, these are the 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 statements that we did. We the survey that we took in the first episode, and the, we're going to talk about the first one and the last one. And the first one is, anyone who works hard enough will succeed. And for that, you say you, that you strongly agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, or strongly disagree. Anyone who works hard enough will succeed. Okay, I'm going to see here. I'm realizing. Uh... This is my script. Oh gosh. Did I put the whole thing in? I don't even remember if I kept it. Gosh, it's been a while since we did this. 
Do you have what you put? I told everybody to keep what they put. I now... have what I put. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, oh, I saved it like you. I saved it like you told saved, me to. I saved it. It's just like it's in my it's in my script document, and I found I found it. Okay. 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 So you've got yours. Yeah. I've got mine. I okay. saved mine in a text file in the same folder that I keep all the shit for this stream. So I knew right where it was. <laughs> So, um, by the way, I hear gravel and I heard a door. So Mexican tonight, folks. Woo! There's the other door. Um, so, so okay. Do um, so uh, uh, anyone who works hard enough will succeed. <coughs> right. I said my answer to that was D. Strongly disagree. <coughs> Strong. Strongly disagree. Yes. I put. Um, um, <laughs> I put, um, C somewhat disagree. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so if you want to share your answer for what you put for anyone who works hard enough will succeed. If you want to put that in chat, if you want to share it, I would, I would love that, but please don't feel like there's any obligation to do so. Yeah. And a few so people have already shared. And so far it's all strongly disagrees. Ah, um, I put I put C somewhat disagree because um, I deliberately chose to leave uh, uh, two things, um, several things. I, I deliberately choose to leave some things ambiguous. Um, yeah, I chose somewhat disagree because um, obviously anyone uh, leaves it. You know, it makes makes it disagree. I mean, not everyone who works hard will. Uh, be able to provide for themselves, um, right. for example, um, or ha or be ridicul ridiculously wealthy. That's for certain. Okay, I, I love I love for uh, some random geek. For the most part, definitely. D. <laughs> I, I love the phrasing there. That's just yes. Yeah, for the but, most part, uh, definitely. There, there's something. Um, the, the idea of who works hard enough. That's not. That's left open for yeah. interpretation you know what can, what, what what do we constitute as hard enough how much is, how oh god i think i have a video about that how much is enough yeah how much is yeah. enough and then um we'll be successful well what constitutes success yeah it's all open to and i think the, the a lot of the differences between the answers to these questions you know really really hang on how you interpret the question Yes, you exactly. Know. And so that's why that's why the, the, the whole point of this is on, in, a, in a typical year is this leads into our Socratic discussions. This was not a typical year. And I did more with the data analysis and, you know, the interpretation. And this is what we think this means and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, Pedro pointing out a lot of people who don't work hard at all. Um. And, and again, I, I guess, you know, what, what constitutes, I would say that a lot of the people that, you know, the, the, the billionaires that, that we, you know, um, is despise too hard a word? I don't think it is. <laughs> no, certainly not too hard. No. Not just that, but, but, but that we, we, you know, I don't want to say mock exactly because it's not just mockery, but that, that we slam for their, their practices. They have worked hard. You know, as as much as I, you know, roll my <coughs> eyes at Elon Musk and, you know, the, the the whole, the fact that he didn't actually start Tesla. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, and, and some of the... He didn't the, actually invent a lot of the stuff that people give him credit for inventing. Yeah, but, you know, he, he was involved in the process <laughs> yeah. and, and development of a lot of that stuff. You know, I don't, you know, I'm not saying he hasn't worked hard, you know, Um and, and again, what counts is working hard. So yeah. So you know, I, I do. I do want to acknowledge that people typically who are successful do have to work hard. They don't just not, they they just obviously obviously who the the ultra wealthy do not work that much harder than people who are you know poor or even moderately wealthy and successful. Yeah. No. And there <laughs> are a lot of. I mean, the, the reason why I said strongly disagree is there, there are just, there are a lot of other factors and, yeah. and as, as, pe as, as people are saying in the chat, you know, there, there are lots of people who work incredibly hard and do not, you know, get ahead, do not succeed. So, 
Um, you know, it's, but it, it, you know, it depends on how you interpret the question. Um, it depends on, uh, you know, what you, cause, cause let me, the, the question is, or the, the statement is anyone who works hard enough will succeed. Like to me, that seems, yeah that, that seems a pretty definitive statement, you know, yes. but, but there are, but other people can interpret it and find, you know, room in there for, for, you know, movement that I just don't, I just don't see, you know, yes. the phrasing of it to me makes it sound like, okay, that's uh, a definitive statement. If you work hard, you will succeed. And yes. I just think that's, uh, to, to use a technical term, horseshit. Oh my. Um, I really like Joe's comment. It's hard work to exploit that many people. Yeah. That's a at lot least, of at least at first until you get, until you learn to delegate, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so the other one that I wanted to bring up was number 13. Yes. I wanted to jump ahead. So number 13, which is the last one, uh, is people who aren't successful just didn't work hard enough. Strongly agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, strongly disagree. Uh I said somewhat disagree, but, you know, take my answer with, you know, many, many, many grains of salt because yes. I've done this for years. <laughs> right. And I said uh, I strongly disagree. Okay. Uh, so I see a strong disagree from Radical Bacon. There's another one from Emily. Y'all. Oh, my goodness can't wait to see it. So the key is with this one is you guys may have noticed, oh, Charles Chapman. Now I'm really. Yeah. No, Charles is, is the, is the interesting one. No, 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 no. Because he says changing to, he said earlier, he said the parsing of the question is making me lean towards changing to the C answer. Oh, okay. Well then and never Andy, mind. No, on, on the previous one. So apparently yeah, he, yeah. Had D on, he had D on the previous one. Well, no, I'm he had B on the previous one. Oh, 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 Charles, hooray, hooray. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. So, so if you pay attention to these, and this is the reason that one is the very first one and one is the very last one. Joe Joe's McClory got it. nailed got it. It is the same prompt and it's phrased the other way around. And, um, and my point with this is to talk about the way that information is presented because one of the things, because, uh, we didn't, we weren't able to do the in-class discussions, which take a lot. I mean, it takes an entire, we're on block schedule. So our classes are like 97 minutes long. It takes an entire class period to have discussions the way I set them up. So this one is, um, the first one, anyone who works hard enough will succeed. And so um, this is a, a sort of a technology and information analysis project that I have them do. It looks like a math pr project, but it's the, the way that I connected with English is that, you know, you're looking at this information, here are the numbers. I give, um, all the students take it, at, but they, they submit it through Google Docs on Classroom. So their name is attached to the assignment. But on the doc itself, I have them make up a pseudonym. They they can choose any school appropriate name that they <laughs> want. school appropriate guys. And then Very they important. Get responses. And then I download all of those and um change them from docs to PDFs. And then I'm fortunately able to do this um on online, just take all the PDFs and merge them all together into one PDF, page after page after page after page after page. And then each student is given a different prompt and they go through and they count up their were 58 total responses and they count up um they are given one prompt they count up how many people said strongly agree how many people said somewhat agree how many people said somewhat disagree and how many people said strongly disagree and then they count up um the total numbers for each of those and then they calculate the percentages and then they also count up the total number of agrees the total number of disagrees and the percentages of those um, and then they represent it. This is actually just, it's just a table. And then they, they fill in the cells. So this is um, for the first prompt. Anyone who works hard enough will succeed. This is strongly agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, strongly disagree. So yeah. it's, it's interesting that they 
Um, and you can see this is where the student's name was. I put a piece of tape over it and then I sharpied and over scribbled it. scribbled on it. <laughs> this is actually the student. This is not the student who did the prompt. This is the student who had this analysis. Right. Um, and then, um, you know, so, so they, they did some... They did some number crunching. They also worked with uh, tables, which is the first time we, uh, a lot of them had done that. Yep, Kitty. Um, this is a lot of the first time a lot of them had done that. I know it was, I had to, I, we took our time going through, this is how you fill in a cell. Da, da, da. So this is not spreadsheet, an important spreadsheet or anything. They made this table. Um, well, I made the table, they filled it in. This is actually, yeah. this was a template that um, on Classroom, you can create a doc and have students open their own copy like each student gets a copy so they were able to do that and then i also had them uh i said remembering that one meant strongly agree two meant someone agreed da, da, da. looking at the results what inferences can you notice about the patterns you see uh go beyond making observations what do these observations lead you to think um uh, but remember these guys these 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 are kids they're 14 and 15 the, the differences between their responses and our responses as people who are, you know, more, not less, less in the, you know, not typically don't have people taking care of us, um, are older, have had the experience of attempting to have a job and take care of ourselves. Um, what I noticed about these results is that 48% of people somewhat agreed that if you work hard enough, you will somewhat agreed. That's just the somewhat agrees is 48, 48% of the entire group. Right. Um, what I learned from this is that most people think you will succeed if you work hard enough, but life can flip you upside down and make you fall, make you, make you, excuse me, make you fail. And then the graph for the last one, 13, people who aren't successful just didn't work hard enough. It looks like this. Yeah, even more strongly lopsided. Agree, somewhat, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, strongly disagree. Yeah. So that's what I use to illustrate visually that the way that information is presented can make a heck of a difference if, yeah. if we're not careful. And it's really interesting that as, you know, we're demographically different from, you know, I, I talked to students about the fact that they're not a representative sample of all Americans. You know, they're all the same age. They're from the same area. Um, they have, you know, somewhat in in many cases relatively similar levels of you know uh economically they're they're an economically a similar demographic um with with some deviation there but man that age and experience i mean that's yeah uh, it was it was it was really really encouraging to see how many people had this because i i will say it's when you know take a look at the answers for your first response and your last response, because it's the same thing the other way around. And yeah. they start they start thinking about that. And I don't I don't ask them to share their answers. You know, just take a look at the first and the last, yeah. and think about that. And that's just they start. I, you know, it's really interesting. And that is why that one's the first and one's the last to give you. It's not. We will talk about the other. The other ones do relate to the other West more, but that's why I placed them where I did. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, best is so subjective and it's just, oh, but yeah, that's, I, I really think that particular project is an eye opener in a number of ways, but yeah, in terms of, of thinking about the way information is presented and how we respond the way we do and teaching them to be critical thinkers, not just in the sense of problem solving skills specifically, but in, in, in terms of saying, okay, what this is, where did they get this information from? Who's paying for it? What did they actually say? What can we figure out based on that? So, yeah. And the, uh, the, the actual statements are very relevant to the book. Yes. And be, because the whole premise of the book is, you know, there are these, about the choices that we make. There are these two guys who are from the same general area, who are roughly the same age, who are the same race, um, who same had, gender, had the same name, same yeah, same name. Um, I mean, not, not that that's actually demographically significant, but, but 
they're that similar. I mean, they're, 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 they're yeah. yeah, I mean, they're, they're different in ways too, but, but they're very similar in a lot of ways. They check a lot of the same boxes and yet they had vastly Wildly. different, yeah, yeah. Uh, life paths. And so, it, which I mean, you know, so what, but well, let's, so let's, what did it happen? Yeah. yeah that's so what is the, what is the, what is the reek? And can we even make, you know, can we even answer that question? definitively can we even say oh here's why this happened or mm -hmm. is it too complex to put a button on like that mm -hmm. um so we're going to talk about the second chapter of the book and uh -huh. this chapter is subtitled in search of home and it, it takes place in 1984 so uh, as was explained in the introduction which we talked about in the first video every chapter will sort of be split between Wes, the author, and the other Wes, and um, it will sort of give us a window into where they were in their lives during a given year. And the year of chapter two is 1984, and they're both still kids. Uh, they're both in elementary school. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the other Wes is a couple years older than yeah. Wes, the author, but not there's not a, a significant age gap. They're both still in elementary school. They were both born in the, the late 70s, um, the mid to late 70s. And uh, and we start this time with the other Wes. We catch up with what the other Wes was doing. I have uh, to, I, I do, I, I, I push my students pretty strongly sometimes, depending on how strong they have pushed, away from calling them because because they, they, they typically, at least, usually several of them will gravitate toward calling them the good Wes and the bad Wes. Yeah. Just, okay, so we're going to refer to them as the author and the other Wes. Yeah, which um, you have to be careful. They'll, they'll, say, they'll say smart Wes and prison Wes. I'm no. like, oh, boy. That's, even, well, that's not good either. I, I, I would say, can we get more judgy? But I already know the answer to that. We're, we're just, we just ain't going there, kiddos. I, I do. I feel like, though, we have the makings for an incredibly specific Abbott and Costello routine here, depending on Which how West? we, well, you know, because you could say one is the other Westmore and, and then there's also the author Westmore. Oh, other and author? They're pretty close. I feel like we might have something there. Yeah, but I mean, that's already been done, so, I not mean. By, not by us. Not by us. And not about this particular book that probably not that we're, all we're that many people have read. Right but, now. Yeah. All right, all right. All so. Right. So, yeah, so we're starting with The Other Wes. Um, and uh, he is, uh, and, and, we, and we have a scene between uh, Wes and his older brother, Tony. Uh, and and at the beginning of this scene, we also get a little bit of background on uh, the Murphy Holmes projects, which is an area in Baltimore where at at this point in the story where where the other Wes and his mom uh, used to live. They don't live there anymore, but his brother Tony still lives there. And uh, the Murphy Holmes are a really, really rough part of town, uh, as as described in in this chapter um it's it's yeah it's difficult like I, I struggle with projects because i mean i want people to have access to housing but projects often get like <laughs> the, the phrase is projects often get neglected and then immediately my mind goes to my students I'm like yeah. yeah like yeah you like neglect your projects too don't you <laughs> Yeah, little jerks. Uh, you, know all, you know all about neglected projects, they, they don't you, kids? Once, once they're once they're a week out from the end of the entire term, they're like, "Miss Gold, Miss Gold, Miss Gold, Miss Gold." Oh my goodness gracious! I lost count of how many. Um, I, I didn't. I I got so many late assignments turned in today that I I I didn't get to grade any of them. All I had time to do was answer the email saying, I have received your project. I have received your project. I have received your project. I've yeah. received, or I've received your assignment. I have received your assignment. I will get it graded. It inc now includes the, you know, my, my copy pasta includes the line, please be patient. Yeah. Give me a break. 
I will get this graded in time for grades to go final. Please be patient. Yeah. But oh my um, goodness. So yeah, I mean, I think the you know you say you're. I mean the the, the wait, prop. Wait, wait, wait. I have sodas in the freezer. I'll be right back. Uh, okay. Yeah, don't let them freeze. Again. How exciting! It's like an action movie. Uh, um. Oh. Hopefully, hopefully they're right at that perfect phase where they're just starting oh, to get little no, ice crystals had, in them. I had, I had told our, I had told somebody about them, and they, they, because I was on here talking to you guys, they, they very, very thoughtfully and without interrupting me or letting me know, they took them. They, they saw me put them in the freezer, and they knew that I have the superpower of forgetting things. And they took care of me. Good. <laughs> So no, no, no concrete soda cans. No, no frozen soda mess. <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, I, yeah, but, I, mean, the, the, I mean, the problem with public housing projects, I mean, people sort of, people blame, not, not everybody, but assholes, people who look down on the poor and look yes, down on the inner assholes. cities. Um, they, they, they tend to sort of blame the projects and the people that live there as though they're these inherently you know, uh, negative things. And the reason why public housing projects get bad when that does happen is because they don't, nobody spends any money on them. They, yeah. they build them and then they just let them go to seed. And because the people, I mean, part of the idea is that this is low income housing, which means people may not have like, People who live there don't have a lot of money. That's why they live there. You no, know, I mean, like a new roof, really expensive. Oh yeah. my God, it's expensive. Like siding, siding is really expensive. Yeah. I mean, you need it for like, you know, the health of your house. Gutters, our, our house doesn't have, have gutters. Like it hasn't had them ever. And so we're kind of worried about, you know, the house but I mean, everything's so expensive, it's expensive. Right now. and yeah, it's and if you and people are just like, well, you know, it's you know, they they don't take care of it. I was like, you're not food, dude. Yeah, like, take like, yeah. Oh. When are they supposed to take care of it? When they're working like you know, twelve hour days at minimum wage jobs, or when they're taking well, care of their kids? From one or... job to the other. Yeah, I mean, know, what, on it... on public transportation because yeah. they car, you know, they don't have a reliable uh, yeah. car. Yeah, what, the, the, it's like what, or when they're paying for their car having broken down again. Yeah, exactly. Like when, when are, when and with what are they supposed to take care of these projects without assistance? You know, and yeah. But so anyway, so so yeah, the 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 Murphy the Murphy Homes projects are are at this point in the story are a are are, are a nightmare. They're not good people. The people who do live there don't enjoy it. They're sort of uh, controlled by drug dealers and and people who either drug dealers or people who have drug habits that have gotten control of them, that uh, lead them to lead very unhealthy lifestyles, and it's just not a nice place to live. And uh, like I said, Wes and his mom lived there for a while and have now left by this point, but his brother Tony is still there, and and but he still talks to Tony. Like they're 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 in touch a lot. And, um, and we talk about yeah. how we talked, I think last time, because it was at the end of the chapter, how Wes has his dad's mom to turn to like for, for, for help. Not, not, not that he turns to her, but his mom is able to connect with Wes's dad's mom, even though Wes's dad is, you know, I mean, it, it, I'm sorry, I'm pulled in two directions here with, with Charles Chapman's company. They don't have the luxury to do even free maintenance. Yeah, because free maintenance, like, you still have to get the stuff. Right. It's not actually free. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so anyway. So, but Tony is, is often there because that's where his dad is. And we right. don't, you know, it's not, it's not Tony's story, um, but we don't know anything about any other support that tony has and yeah you know there's there's some support for wes although you know his dad shows up and so it's not completely secure for him you know his dad his dad shows up and his dad is or his dad's there and his dad is drunk so it may not be completely safe for him um 
but you know his, also his his grandmother's there and so it is some you know he has some protection um but we don't see any of that for tony nothing no, no. um but tony is uh, as as much as he can be tony seems like a good big brother to wes yes. and, and 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 the the reason for uh the reason for this phone call that begins this chapter is uh tony is calling wes because wes is at the end of elementary school and he's and he's about to enter middle school and tony is sort of riding him and pushing him to take it seriously and to you know to study and to think about what he wants to do and to you know be prepared for this next step in his education and he feels like wes is just kind of blowing it off and he sort of brings him up short. He says, you know, you need to take this shit seriously, man. And we're told through the the text that Tony doesn't want, and Tony's only 14. Yeah. But he's six years older than Wes. Tony doesn't want Wes to find himself in the situation that Tony is in. Because even though we're told that Tony has a lot of respect on the street um, and and is, is taken seriously by his peers and... Uh, uh, you know, has uh, carved out sort of a stable niche for himself. It's not a good life. Tony doesn't like it. He doesn't necessarily want it. He wouldn't have chosen this life for himself. And he doesn't want Wes to wind up in the same place in six years when Wes is a teenager. Um, so Tony is sort of, you know, trying to splash some cold water in Wes's face and saying, hey, you know, you're starting middle school. You need to straighten up. You need to take this seriously. Um, and it doesn't really uh, come home to Wes at this point because he idolizes Tony. Like he thinks that the way Tony is, is fine. You know, he sort of I sees Tony. I mean, Tony's his big brother. Yeah, Tony's his brother. Yeah, absolutely. And Tony's kind of a badass. And, and Tony and Tony has stuff. Yeah, yeah. Wes ain't got nothing. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 they're broke. <laughs> they don't have money. But Tony has money. Tony has money because Tony is a very successful and enterprising drug dealer. At 14, guys. At 14. Um, we're told that, and yeah, he's, four, we're, we're told that. And he's, he, and he's, and he's vicious. He, yeah. Cause not only, he doesn't just like sell drugs on the corner near his house. Like he started his own operation and expanded into other neighborhoods where he had to fight the drug dealers who were already there for the territory so that he and his people could stand on those corners and sell drugs. And he did, and he won, and they respect him now. Um, so it's a really- or, or they don't respect him because they're dead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that he, he, he fought for his place in this sort of, you know, unfamiliar territory, and he, and he got it. And again, it's a really, really tough life, but, you know- Tony is, is Tony is an example of the first prompt. Anyone who works hard yeah. enough is successful. He seems to work pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. And he has a sort of success. Um, one of my study guide questions is explain the term ice grill and its application in the story. Yes. Uh, yeah. The, the, the ice grill, it's sort of, I, I was reminded of, it's not exactly the same thing, but it, it immediately reminded me of, uh, the thousand yard stare mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, people say that like, I think it's particularly veterans of Vietnam were said to get the thousand yard stare where you've been, you've been in combat for so long. You've been shot at so many times. You're just completely numb to everything. And you just, your eyes just are completely blank and you just, you're staring at nothing. You're just sort of sitting there and you're completely numb and you're just dead inside. That's the thousand yard stare. And the ice grill sounds kind of like that, but there's also like an intensity to it. You know, it's like, it's the ice grill is the, you do not want to fuck with me. Look, you know, um, yeah, because they say that it, 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 it the, um, the author Wes in his writing describes it as the ice grill. It evokes both fire and, and ice because when you think even though grill means your face grill you also think grill like you know a hot surface that you cook food on so it makes you think of heat but it also has ice so you're simultaneously hot and cold 
Um, and it's just is that uh, Frost, Fire and Ice. Huh? The poem. I think it's called Fire and Ice by Frost. Oh, I don't know. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've learned about desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But from what I've tasted of destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. It sounds so, like frost. <laughs> I know. Um, speaking of ice. Ah, uh, 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 nice. So fun and I'm so, so, uh, new D, &D con concept. Joe Pesci is a cleric who kills guys who don't respect him and then can't speak with that saying, yes, respect me now. So, yeah. Jim Baker says it's a statement about the duality of man. Indeed, sir. sir. Yes, that indeed. Indeed, my liege. Uh, no, no, no. Aaron what? Burr, sir. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Pardon me. Is that a statement about the duality of man, sir? Sir. Or, or Mr. Knox, sir. Mr. Knox, now come, now come, now don't. Oh, right. From, yeah. Now. From uh, Fox and Socks. Yeah. Fox and Socks. Um, yeah. So, so, so Tony's. Uh, Tony's make Tony making an effort. He's, and, he, yeah. He's and working he, hard in a different way now. And he's on the phone with Wes and he's yelling at Wes and basically telling him to straighten his shit up. And uh, then Wes gets off the phone with him and he then he gets uh, a call from his friend, Woody, who lives in his neighborhood and Woody wants to hang out. And then we get a little bit of, of history um, about... Uh, basically where Wes and, and his mom have lived in the last few years. They, um, they lived in the, the, uh, the Murphy projects. They lived in uh, Cherry Hill, which is where Woody is. Then they moved to where they are now, which is Northwood, which is a nicer neighborhood. Um, but, you know, he still hangs out with Woody and Woody wants to just, you know, get together and hang out. Um, so he he goes downstairs to uh to meet with Woody and we also learn that Wes plays football and uh he plays for uh, a rec team which is basically kind of like the the football version of like a little league team like he doesn't play for a school team it's like an independent but organized league kind of like Pop Warner football um and that his team is one of the best of those teams in the country. So he's apparently, he's good at football for his age and, and he plays with a lot of other kids that are good at football. Um, and they say, and it, it tells us that he's actually kind of a natural, you know, and that it gives him something to channel his, to channel his, his energies into. And it gives him something to take pride in mm -hmm. because he takes pride in his team and wearing his Jersey and people, other people knowing what a good team they are, you know? Yeah. <sighs> But the, the other side of that is that uh, his grades are slipping. Yeah. Because he's spending all of his time working on football, worrying about football. Football has become sort of the centerpiece of his, of his life, and he's not doing so well in school, which is one of the things that Tony was up his ass about. Yeah, I have some kinds of feelings about that. Oh, really? Yeah. I just, I mean, as a teacher, you don't, you, you have a problem with kids letting athletics distract from their schoolwork. More, more, more broadly, okay. I have a problem with the way that we monetize and then idealize the capitalization of and the profiteering on a game mm -hmm. i i mean and because it because because you know what so many kids who play this game want isn't the just the fun of the game as some random geek points out um, 
what they want is what what Wes has, you know, that sort of respect. They want to be they want they want to be Tom Brady. My God. Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't? You have you're like ridiculously wealthy. Everybody knows who you are. Everybody knows that you are the best. Everybody, you know, admires and envies you. And if they dislike you, it's because they envy you. You know, that, I mean, that that's the reason, you know? Yeah. And it's, you know, the, the, that, that search for glory and wealth and, you know, prosperity. I, I understand the, the search for, you know, comfort and its stability, but I'm not, I'm just, I'm, I, and part of it is I'm just such a competitive person that I literally, it, you know, it, it can make me feel ill. It's very stressful for me. Yeah. So I, I have chosen to channel my um, pursuits elsewhere. <laughs> but seeing, and, and I see it in my students too, and, and just, you know, that they push themselves to get, you know, the, the expectations that are placed on them. I ha literally had this conversation today, you know, you're more than, you're more than a number. Mm. You're more than that, that grade. There's so much. I've had that conversation repeatedly today. Now that we're at the, at the end of the term, yeah. When grades are foremost on many people's minds, yeah. Yeah, and I'm just, but I mean, for for the students that I teach, grades are pretty much on their mind a lot. You know, more than more than you know, some other students. But it's about it's about that respect that if I'm not the A student, if I'm not the smart kid that everybody thinks of me as, then then who am I? Yeah. And that's, you know, that, that's kind of, I mean, this, this is becoming, you know, the reason that it's so important to us is this is who he is. And if he's not, you know, that kid who's good at football, well, then who is he? You know, and who cares about that? Oh, gosh, yeah. there's just. Oh. Well, and especially when you're, you're a young person and you're, you're constantly searching for your identity anyway. You know, and, yeah. and if you find something that feels right for you, then you, you want to have it validated and you want to have it reinforced. And and if you find something if, and if school's not it, if, if you don't feel like you're a good student or your grades aren't giving you that feeling, but sports are or not just sports, anything else, you know, the 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 impulse is to run toward it. Yeah. And to and to and to make that your thing. Yeah. Because when, I mean, every, I think everybody feels this way to a, to one degree or another, no matter what age they are, but especially when you're an adolescent, yeah. you, you feel like, well, I, every, I need a thing. I need a thing. What's my thing? Who am I? What, what do I hang my personality on? You know, you feel like you need that. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah. and that's, but at the same time, it's one of the reasons that I love teaching 10th graders because they're right at that point where they're moving away from the things that they have been that, that you know things that essentially their family has supported them in and starting to say no i think this is what i like and so i had a, a great sit down did i bring it home i think i left it at school <laughs> may still be there um i had a great sit down with one of my students who's struggling to pass um and you know she showed me some of her drawings that she had done and i said let me bring in um i had a summer uh, several years ago, and this is the, the later ones are actually dated. It was 2014, um, so quite a few years ago. In her, in, in her mind, a long time ago, I'm sure. Where I tried to do one drawing every day, and I focused on like faces mm -hmm. um, for 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 quite some time. And uh, you know, just one drawing every day through the summer. Yeah. And um, so I brought it in, and I put I did I just did it on copy paper and then I put it in sheet protectors and I would on the I would have it if I had a reference you know reference on the left you know my picture on the right and so we sat down at the you know end of class one day and she's in my last class and she actually stayed with me after the bell just looking at these pictures that I drew years ago um seven, god seven years ago now yeah almost seven years old seven years of summer and um and so yeah she would have been like a little munchkin elementary yeah. school kid at the time 
And, uh, you know, she, you know, she said, I can, you know, I can see the improvement. I said, it's, you know, what you do, you get better at what you do at doing the thing. And uh, so we, we talked about that some, and I, I said, but this is something that I just, I just started doing, you know, in my, in my late thirties, I just decided to try it out and, and essentially giving the idea that the thing that you pick doesn't have to be your thing for like the rest of your life. No. You can have nope. a new, you can have a new thing or a different thing. You can change your thing. It's yeah. okay, and 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 healthy to try new things all throughout your life, and um. And none of it has to be, what defines you. You have value regardless of what your grades are, regardless of how good you are on the football team. You matter, just, just for being, just for being you. You already matter. Yeah. And, and there's so much in our society that pummels them constantly with other messages. Like you have to be this, to have value. You have to do this, to have value. No. Yeah. And, and, and also not society and, and school culture in general. Cause I know this, it was definitely this way when I was in school once upon a time and from talking with you, yeah from talking with you about your students and, and, you know, how things are in high school now, it seems like this hasn't really changed. Unfortunately, uh, the pressure of if you screw up now, you know, it will follow you for the rest of your life. It'll be and on your permanent, it'll be record. on your permanent record. Yeah. And, or like, if you, you know, if you don't and like everything, everything that happens to you for the rest of your life rests on decisions you make right now as a 15 year old kid, if you don't get good grades, you won't get into the good to the best classes. And if you don't get into the best classes, then you won't do good on the SATs. And if you don't get a high score on the SATs, then you won't get into a good college. And if you don't get into a good college and it just, it's like, it's just this one, one it's potential it's catastrophe. Hamster, it's hamster I, I yeah. talked about my failure video. Yeah. And and, and it's like, I mean, I don't want kids in high school to think that what they're doing doesn't matter. Yeah. Because yeah. it but definitely there, there's, does. There's a purpose there. A well, good intent. They're good intentions. You know what good intentions do? You know what? They they, they pave the road to hell, folks. Come yeah. on. But yeah, it's like, because uh, one of the people, people have asked me before, you know, like if you could go back in time and talk to yourself when you were in high school, like what advice would you give? And one of the things, one of the pieces of advice I would give to anybody in high school, especially people who are, who are struggling or who are having trouble or feel like they're not sure where their life is going, or they're just in a bad spot. Um, I would say, you know, just get through this because if you get through it, you would be, and I mean, there are obviously exceptions to this. There are people who have like really serious problems, but those aside, if you get through it and you get out of high school, you will be, you will not believe in five years, in 10 years, so many of the things that seemed of absolute importance to you will not matter to you at all. Um, and it's just either you have such a warped perspective as both a young person and a student, someone who's sort of in an enclosed environment in school. Um, and when you get out of that, your perspective shifts so dramatically, you will not believe how different things look. And a lot of these things that are taking up all of your time and all of your thoughts and are giving you such restlessness and such anxiety, uh, I'm not saying it will be that, that way with everything, but with a lot of these things, it just, it will not be important to you at all. You'll, you'll, you'll think about it and you'll look back and you'll go, wow, can you believe my life used to revolve around that? Or can you believe that's the kind of shit I used to worry about? Like, um, you just need to get through it. And, I, I yeah. disagree strongly. <laughs> I mean, not, not, not that I dis disagree strongly with what you're saying, but my statement would be very different from yours. Mine would be find someone that you can find an adult that you can trust. That would be the most important oh, thing. Oh, that's what you would say to the, if you could to go any, back and- if Everybody, you could, everybody. If you, your advice that you, would say. Yeah. you can trust. Everybody needs- That's a good one too. You can talk to. I mean, and, and I know that I am in many ways an outlier, but for me, a lot of the things that I cared about in high school, um, look, dude, high school is where I discovered Batman. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and in high school, um, the importance 
of having what was important to me was having a plan. Like not, not necessarily that I would follow it, but that I knew where I was headed and what my next step was and that the plan went beyond that and that I could change it along the way if I wanted to. That's still like, like, that's like, that's it. If I like, if I have a problem and I, and there's either, I don't know what, I don't know what my options are or there's nothing that I can do about it. Or like, I don't know some of the, you know, some of the contributing factors. Woo, that is like intensely stressful for me. It's very unpleasant. And it always has been. Like yeah. it always has been. And so, and, but I mean, that was something that it didn't stress me out so much in high school, but like, because I was able to make plans and say, here's what I want to accomplish. Here's how I want to go about it. Like I literally did things. Now, some of that is also because we didn't have back in my day, we didn't have computerized schedules. It was all on paper. Yeah. So when I said, I'd like to um, go to my French class Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and then see if I can't take Spanish on Fridays and get to where I can, you know, do well on the final exam and then go into Spanish two next year. And they said, sure, go for it. Uh, <laughs> and I, that's what I did. And, um, and then I think I took um, band Monday, Wednesday, Friday against my phys ed requirement Tuesday, Thursday, if I remember correctly. And then chorus was Tuesday, Thursday against advanced composition Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which was an honors class. And that teacher was not happy about that. But she was like, she has to keep up with all of her work. And I did. Um, and um, I, I was there for, for the, you know, English class. We didn't have AP English or AP Lit or anything, but I, I can still, I can probably still write, recite the out, out brief candle speech from Macbeth, which we had to memorize. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there were, I mean, and essentially I just went to the principal and said, here's what I want to do. And he said, you know, keep your grades up and okay. <laughs> That was, that was that was it, you know. I learned and I, I learned to make a plan, say here's what I want, and and to ask for things and to advocate for myself. And you know, I just some I think some of that is is you know being a teacher's kid and having been yeah. know, knowing the system, and also the importance of that. I mean, students like they internalize the importance of grades. Be because our society is so competitive. It's about, you know, ranking each other and how do you fit into yeah. the hierarchy? I mean, yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. It's yeah. a hierarchy. And I, it, I, it, it grates on me so much that, you know, that parents so often and, and it, uh, that their yeah. parents often are concerned about their students' grades. And I can't, tell them that I'm concerned about their students' mental health and honestly well-being. And I want to tell them to back off and stop pushing so hard and because I think their student is suffering. Yeah. And I can't, I can't say that. I'm getting yeah. so much trouble. And legally, I don't, and, and um, professionally, I don't have the, you know, the actual background, like the training to be allowed to say that professionally, right. but just from having seen a generation of students come through my classes, like the, you know, yes, you tell your kids you love them, but then you, you know, when you act like their grades are so don't, don't ask them, you know, are your assignments turned in, ask them what they're learning. Ask them yeah. what, you know, what the topic was in class today. You know, don't, you know, you want to go in between, um, you know, if you just say, what did you do in, in school today? I mean, that's so open-ended that it's too much. Um, but if you only ask about, well, did you finish all your work? Then that's what it becomes about. You know, did you, you know, what, when's the next test? That's what it becomes about. I just, oh. Yeah. I'm sorry. We're not really talking about the book. I'm well, writing. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to drag you back in that direction though. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> I, I need it. I need it. I need to, I, I, I need to drag us back onto the road, but it, I mean, not that I have, I mean, this is all 
great. But I mean, um, let's talk about the fight. So uh, the big yeah, event. We were going there before with, you know, bringing up football. You were heading yeah, that. The, the, the big event in chapter two for the other Wes is he and Woody hook up with a couple of other friends and they get into a, a football game with some other kids in the neighborhood. So this isn't like an official game in their league. This is just like a street game that they're playing amongst themselves. And one of the kids on the other team gets into it with Wes and ends up punching him. And uh, then after he gets punched, Wes kind of flashes back to some advice that Tony gave him mm -hmm. um, at some indeterminate point in the past. And then we learned that even though Tony is in many ways a good big brother and tries to, to look out for Wes, some of Tony's advice is not always the best advice in every situation because what Tony tells or told Wes that we learn in this sort of flashback is that um, he, he says to Wes, rule number one, if someone disrespects you, you send a message so fierce that they won't have the chance to do it again. And that makes perfect sense in a place like the Murphy Projects, where it's really tough. And if you let someone get one over on you, then other people will view that as a sign of weakness. And you'll just you'll, you'll have to deal with it more and more and more like Tony's advice in that kind of dog eat dog environment where you have to stand up for yourself and you have to stand your ground. And if somebody steps up to you, you have to step right back to them. And if they raise their fist, you have to raise yours too. And if there's a fight, you damn well be sure you win that thing, or at least put in a good enough showing that people know they can't just push you over. Like that's all good advice in that environment, but it doesn't transfer to every place. But unfortunately, young Wes has taken it to heart. So when he gets into this little scuffle with, with a kid on the other football team, he decides, okay, I've been disrespected. I need to yeah. teach this guy a lesson so he knows he can't ever do that to me again. And what he does is he goes, he, he, he goes, he goes home, right? He goes home mm -hmm. and he gets a knife and he's going to go back out and he is bound and determined to stab this kid. He's going to mess this kid up, but because of the fight, the cops have been called. Mm -hmm. So the cops show up. Wes sees the cops. The cops are there. He knows the cops are there. He doesn't care. He goes after this other kid with the knife and he is trying to get at this other kid who punched him and stab this other kid. And the cops step in and fortunately they, uh, they do not use deadly force on him, which, you know, we have to say fortunately, because that, you know, that kind of happens a lot. Even when there's kids involved, it doesn't seem to matter. Cops just like to shoot people sometimes, and it's kind of fucked up. Um, but in this case, Wes doesn't get shot by the cop. The cop uh, gets the knife away from him and, you know, sort of puts him against the hood of the car and handcuffs him and arrests him. And uh, Woody ends up getting his ass arrested too, because he mouths off to the cops in defense of Wes. Uh, but, you know, he ends up getting arrested, too. And they take him to the police station. Wes does not want to tell his mom that he's been arrested. So he calls Tony instead of his mom. And Tony has Tony's dad, who is not Wes's dad, um, but who Wes obviously knows through Tony. Uh, Tony's dad comes and bails him out. And takes him takes him home from the police station and and at the end of this section um before we we jump perspective to uh the author wes uh, the last thing we're told is that it was years before wes's mom found out her son had been arrested that day so this is a secret that he keeps from her for a long time that he get not only does he get in this fight but but that he actually got arrested for it um, mom doesn't find out about that. So yeah, that's what's going on in the other Wes's life. What's interesting is you, you hit a lot of, a lot of the points on my study guide, which I printed out and brought like literally your narration of the chapter. Um, I, you know, explained well, the ice I, grill and I did, I did, I mentioned a couple things. Um, the, the term ice grill and its application in the story, 
explain what happens to West during the football game, describe what West does after running home from the football game and why it is significant, explain the significance of the quote. Rule number one, if someone disrespects you, you said <laughs> years, they won't have a chance to do it again. Predict now what you didn't do, because you were just talking about this chapter, predict how this will impact Wes as he gets older. Now, I mean, talking about it in this chapter, it, this is Wes older because he, you know, we have essentially the flashback. Right. And then when did Wes's mother find out about Wes being arrested is the, the last question that I have. Um, so it's just really interesting that like, you're just like, I'm like, I didn't show this to you. I didn't, no. we, we talked about the two, the two quotes. I, 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 before you read the chapter, I'm like, you know, ice grill. And you're like, yeah. oh, and then I, I, gave yeah. you, I gave you the other quote and you're like, oh, and I'm like, enjoy the chapter. <laughs> yeah. Well, Cause you know, the thing about the, the, the quote, the thing that it made me think of, and it, it reminded me of, of it when, when you told me about it before I read the chapter. And then I still was thinking about it after I read the chapter. Um, the, you know, you make, if somebody disrespects you, you make an example so that they, they don't ever yeah. do that again. Uh, reminded me of uh sean connery's character from the untouchables uh jimmy malone who is when he's explaining how things work on the streets to uh to kevin costner as elliot ness and sort of explaining like you have to be tough if you're going to go up against these gangsters you know you have to be tough and if one of them brings a knife you bring a gun and if one of them puts if they put one of yours in the hospital you put one of theirs in the morgue you know like that's you have to be willing. You have to be willing to escalate, but you escalate to a point that when you do your thing, it's over. You know, uh, that's kind oh, of the jugular, the jugular. <laughs> exactly. Simone from the Lion King, I think. Um, but I mean, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've told you that story, right? <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't know. Maybe the one from where I was, you know, where where uh, I was working at the amusement park. Oh, oh, but about this is about the throat biting. Yes. The throat oh, biting. yes. I've told you've told me this story, but I love this story. Yeah, that that's how you. Yeah, how and, you and deal we with were, the fight. We were, like, you know, we we were. It, it was a little bit quiet, and so there were a couple of us in the. And I never, I very rarely have trouble with uh, the customers to the extent that when they're angry, grumpy customers, they will be like, "Can you send Dana over to the window? Because there are people who want their money back." And be like, "Hi, folks. That is done. I'm just. I'm very good. I'm yeah. Very good at saying no. <laughs> like, no, you I, can't have your money. No, 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 no. That's get not, out. That's not. That's not be, no, you're not very. You're, you're. You're not getting it, Steve. It's like don't I'm, make me call it. Don't make me call security. I am security. Oh well. They, well don't Steve, make me kick your ass out of here. Steve, I know this is your channel. I'm sorry. Shut please, up. please, please continue. I, you know, so, so I'm really good at that. I, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. That's really frustrating that, you know, your kid wasn't allowed to ride the bumper. It's always the bumper cars. Um, cause they're, they're, they're terrifying. I mean, you're, you know, colliding and you have this, you know, loose seatbelt. Yeah, it's a great ride. It's too small. That seatbelt is going to, I mean, literally it's loose and it, it can get them around the freaking neck. And it's not safe. It's like, you know, our, we have to be really, really careful. You know, if somebody, you know, if, well, my kid wouldn't get hurt. Well, I'm glad that your kid didn't get hurt. And, you know, I understand that we have some great rides for, you know, we have rides for, you know, different rides for kids of, of all sizes. You know, there's, there's a great roller. My favorite, one of my favorite rides is there are two roller coasters. They're really like, the little roller coaster where they're riding it. It's their first roller coaster. It's great. It's fun. It's fun to ride as a grown up, and it's adorable when kids ride it and they get off and they're excited. You know, da, 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 I just talk them down. And uh, and so I'm telling this to the other guards in the guard check. I'm like, I just I don't have problems with them. And they're like, yeah, but what would you do? You know, if somebody if somebody actually came at you, I'm like, well, you know, you you have to you know defend yourself and stop them. You just you know, you go for their throat with your teeth. And they they went. Wait, what? I'm like, you, know, just, you just go for it. And, you know, they, first of all, you're not actually going to have to do anything. So, but you be ready just in case that you yeah. will actually follow through, that you Commit. will through their throat with yeah. your teeth. And they're like, oh. Because, I mean, they're, they're talking about, you know, beating somebody down. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you just... Go for the throat. Go for the throat. Tear their throat out. <laughs> and, and so, so, so my my ice grill is 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 apparently you know you just you just go for the throat with your teeth. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's why ice grill. It's just, you know, it's, it's again, it's about, you know, this sort of, it's not the dead eyed stare. It's just, you know, I am telling you that this is how it's going to be. And, and if you want to keep your throat, <laughs> you'll do things my way. Okay. It, you know, and, but I, I, I ne I've never had to do that. I mean, and it, it, it also helps that I'm six foot one and almost 200 pounds. <laughs> so there's also that. See, exactly. And some random geek, did it work? I bet it did. I bet you it did. It's Jack Bauer. Of course it worked. <laughs> he it's like saying, did Batman beat that guy up? Of course he did. It's Batman's show. <laughs> um. So, yeah, it, but very much, you know, there's, there's different types of the whole ice grill thing, but it's, it's all about, yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, I'm... I, you know, but yeah, um, don't mess with people I care about. It, it, I will make sure that you. Uh, and I've, I've also said not the same thing, obviously, but something similar to my students. You know, when, when they come to me, if they say that you know somebody's bullying me, I'll, have you told them that you don't like this thing that they are? What are what are they doing? Have you told this person not to do this? And uh, quite often, you know, they'll they'll be like, well, you know, they should know not. That they should know that I wouldn't like that. I'm just like, no. <laughs> Kids can be way more stupid than you give them credit for. Um, and a, a lot of times they'll sort of laugh along nervously, like, ha, 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 ha. And somebody else is like, but they were laughing along. That's going to be their justification for it. Just, right. you can go and tell them to stop, or I will totally go and tell them to stop. And, you know, then what I want you to do, either way, I think you'll feel more comfortable and more confident about yourself if you do it but i will do it if you you know and i'll do it privately not in front of everybody so it'll just be quiet but here's the thing if they ever do it again you let me know and that'll be the last time that it happens okay and that'll be the last time anybody sees them Yes, yeah, some random geek, you know, and especially with them, you know, they laugh along with it because they don't want to escalate the situation, but they are yeah. laughing along uncomfortably, and this other person should, under and sometimes the other person does understand that it makes them uncomfortable, but they're able to use, well, so-and-so, it was just a joke, so-and-so was laughing too, Exactly. you know, it provides them with plausible deniability, and it's just, it's like so, and, and then, but then there are other times when the person's like, Oh, I mean, like literally that was what happened to me when I was being, you know, not harassed sexually, but I was, I was being pestered in a way that, that, that felt like bullying to me. Yeah. And I finally said, I don't like it when you do this, please stop. And they went, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. And it never happened again. Yeah. And that was, I mean, that was an incredibly important lesson for me. You name the behavior. Don't say you're, you're a jerk or you're don't, don't. It's not the person say, I don't like this thing that you're doing. Please stop. And then, um, and then if they don't, then you, <laughs> then you rat their asses out. Yeah. You well, know? because then you've, 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 you know, you've put the onus on them and you've mm -hmm. said like, you have, you have been informed. You have been that, informed that, and if, that I don't like this. It's very much like saying, you know, um, my, my name isn't Diane. It's Dana. They call me Diane again. Yeah. Then it's disrespectful. Then it's then it's it's throat biting time. Yeah. Like no, no, I've, no. I I told you, this this isn't an innocent mistake no, anymore. No, 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 throat biting time is when they they come they come to physically you know confront you, then you go for the throat. Or or if there if there is physical danger to somebody that I care about or that that I am going to I so, will if there's if there is, then now if if the person has a gun I'm going to be and and they're not and there's and and they're at range I'm going to be I'm going to use different tactics. But, you know, absolutely, if I am between, you know, if, if, if there was, uh, you know, an active shooter in our school and somehow they got through the locked door, you know, and I was, you know, not across the room behind the, you know, heavy teacher desk, which is where my students would be. Um, yeah, it would be throat biting time. Yeah. Uh, but so as far as the name thing, though, I mean, maybe a throat chop. No, that's when, that's what, well, again, you know, there's, you know, I have, I have status. I'm a nice white lady. 
And then, and, and also I'm really good at confrontation through question be like, why did you choose to call me by a name that is not the name that I introduced myself with? As in the, the underlying tone is you're going to die. Yeah. Are you okay with that? And you know, what has gone wrong in your life up to this point that you want to get chopped in the throat this bad? <laughs> So I can make it happen. <laughs> anyway, okay. So anyway, back I to the. Back. We have a whole other half chapter. It's seven forty-five for God's well, sake. but so I think we. Half we chapter to go through. I think we can get through this part pretty quick, though. Okay. Because this is the second half of this chapter is with the uh, the the author. The, the author Wes and. Um, and he don't get arrested. No, this is where I uh, you know again like the the point of the book to contrast the two Wes's and. Uh, uh, Wes, the author, is not his life isn't going particularly great because this is in the aftermath of his father's death. His father has died uh, a couple years ago at this point, and um, we we find that his mom is not taking it very well. That uh, you know she's you know she's sleeping on the couch because she's paranoid that somebody might break into the house, and if somebody breaks into the house, then she wants to be the first person that the intruder encounters, not her kids. And mm -hmm. um, and she's just not, she's not in a good place emotionally or psychologically. And, um, you know, so mm -hmm. they decide that, or she decides that the best thing is to move. And where we she's- talked about this up earlier, or somebody did, I know in chat, talked about the grandparents. Yeah, she's going to move with she's going to move in with her parents who are who live in New York in the Bronx, which is where she's originally from. But so they're going to leave Maryland and they're going to move up to live with her parents in the Bronx. Um, and her her dad is a minister. And does it say does her mom have a job? I can't remember. Or is she just her mom worked. Um... But I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. But, and they're, you know, they're not like super, super prosperous, but they're doing okay. And they own their own house and they have, uh, we're told that when, when Wes and his uh, siblings and their mom uh, move in, then there's seven people in the house all together. So there was, there were people other than the grandparents living there at, you know, when they got there mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and at first Wes is like really excited because, you know, he's, he's, he loves his grandparents and he's visited them before and they visited him and you know, they're like, uh, he, you know, there is, there is grandparents and he loves them and he, he's really looking forward to living there. But then he realizes that it's living in their house is going to be a little different than the interactions that they've had before, because he, 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 he learns very quickly that they have house rules. Mm -hmm. And when you, and live, there's more grownups around now, <laughs> and there's more grownups around, and the the house that the house rules don't sound unreasonable, you know, but they're pretty strict, and it's like and one of the rules is when the um when the street lights come on, you come home, like you know, go outside, run around, make friends, do whatever, but when the street lights come on, you come home. Um, and we're told that the, the neighborhood that they're living in doesn't sound as bad as some of the neighborhoods that the other West has lived in in Baltimore. But we're told that there is like the crime rate is getting a little higher. Um, the drug activity is increasing. Um, yeah. He said, I think that the, the huh? The neighborhood's changing. The neighborhood is changing. I think. Uh, the text describes it. He says this. Uh, the Bronx was going through its post apocalyptic phase which I thought was a really evocative way of describing it. And, and what he means by that is that there are, um, there are entire streets that have just been abandoned. Yeah. It's, it's nothing but empty buildings. Um, and some of that is the fault of landlords who saw property values falling because the, the, the neighborhoods were becoming more low income, et cetera. So they allegedly set fire to their own buildings so they could get the insurance money and just go somewhere else. So it's not, which again, kind of goes back to what we we're talking about earlier about people blame the people who live in the projects for how bad things are. Um, the, the, the instinct might be for someone to look at a neighborhood like that in the Bronx and go, Oh, you know, look what they've done. These drug dealers and, you know, blah, 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 all these gangs, like, look what they've done to this neighborhood. And the damage might not have been caused by gangs or drug dealers. It, the building might be burned out because the landlord set it on fire 
yeah to get the insurance so the landlord could abandon the neighborhood mm -hmm. and 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 make things even worse um you know not deliberately make things even worse but make more money elsewhere yeah i mean make things worse oh. as 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 a side effect of of leaving to make more money yeah oh um, well yeah exactly so no. that's yeah so it's not it's not an ideal place at all but uh we there's seen, more grown-ups in the house there's more there's grown, more grown-ups in the house there's, there's more i grown cannot emphasize this yeah. enough there's, so yeah. um Go ahead. I, I do want to uh point to to uh joe's comment i don't know if you saw it leaving maryland never the wrong choice and then of course that mm, face <laughs> Um, I, I mean, just having having more grownups. So having been to um, Walt Disney World with young children, um, not mine, yeah. <laughs> just in case anybody was wondering. But um, my husband and I took his sister and her husband and their two boys, and um, his parents also went along with us. And let me tell you, when you have six adults and two, like you know, like I think. Uh, they were like four and six at the time, like young kids, but not like out of being toddlers. Um, so much easier. <laughs> I mean, I know people have gone to Disney World and been like, oh God, we were so tired. We were great. <laughs> it was it was fine. You know, I mean, we did a lot and we were tired, but it wasn't, you know, I've been like, how do people do this? Da, 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 da. I'm like, you take enough grownups. Right. So you can have the, so you, so you, you can pass here. the kids around. Yeah. You exactly. can be like, okay, you watch them. You always yeah. got somebody watching the kids yeah. and it ain't always the same person all the time. Right. Oh my goodness. It's it, so helpful when you have enough adults. Yeah. Class size matters. Yeah. Same principle. You need enough grownups for yeah. God's sakes. And we also learn not only that, not only does he have more support in his life in the terms of, in, in terms of, of adults, but, um, he we 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 sort of get the opposite of the interaction the street interaction that we saw from the other west because the other west in his section of the chapter you know he goes he 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 meets his friends and they play a football game and it ends in a fight and he tries yeah. He, yeah it escalates he tries to stab somebody and he ends up getting arrested and west the author uh goes to a basketball court and this is like right after they've moved in. So he doesn't really know anybody yet. He's he's trying to make friends. So he goes to the basketball court and gets in on uh, a game, like a three on three and makes friends and gets along with everybody. And when the street lights come on, he goes home and that's pretty much it. Like it's a really positive experience. Yeah. Um, and, and his part of the chapter and the chapter itself, because this is the end of it, uh, it, it you know, it, it, it is left on a very, very optimistic note because Wes, the author, has, you know, it's he's again in a not completely different situation than the other Wes. But for him, it leads to a positive experience where he makes friends and, 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 and he talks about how people actually it's it's it's. The, the way that basketball fits into the life in this neighborhood and in, in, in a lot of neighborhoods um, is that the basketball court is sort of neutral territory. And even people who have issues with each other outside of the court, when they're on the basketball court, it's just about playing basketball. And yeah, they might talk shit to each other. They might get a little pushy every once in a while. There might be some tension, but the basketball court is considered sacred ground. Yeah. And you don't yeah, that's and, you a de-escalation place. Yes. In, and I, exactly. again, it's, it's, it, I'm, it's hilarious. Cause like, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I, as I'm, I don't know if I mean, you don't, I think we, you have it set up for us to alternate, yeah. but like, as you're talking, I'm looking over here at my study guide. And once again, <laughs> you're, just, you're answering the questions without looking at the questions, you know, explain where messes, messes, where Wes's mother moves the family and why. What was one of the first things, although it, this was more specific, what was one of the first things that Wes saw as they entered the Bronx? You talked about more of the, 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 the phrase, um, the, the, the post-apocalyptic, uh, my mouth is just not working. Post-apocalyptic. Uh, there we go. Um, but yeah, and then uh, explain why Wes called the basketball court in the Bronx the neutral ground. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's interesting. And I hadn't actually... Um, 
I don't, I kind of don't want to add another question because there's 11 for this chapter. Um, but, you know, pointing out the, the way the, 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 the contrast between football and how it escalates and how basketball de-escalates, you know, for, for one, yeah. the, 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 the athletics lead to escalation. And for the other, it, it adds to de-escalation. Yeah. yeah. Well, and because it's it's sort of like what you were talking about with competition is that depending on how you look at it, how you feel about it, you know, like like the, the competition, the, the 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 sport in the other West's section mm-hmm. is it it, it 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 tears them apart. You know, it it pits them against each other in a very mm-hmm. negative way, whereas the basketball in West, the author's section, even though, I mean, they're, they're playing, they're keeping score. Like they're playing against each other They're yeah. It is a competitive sport. Fun. It's a competitive sport, but yeah. Like, well, like you said a minute ago, like it, it, it's, it's a way to sort of channel things into a less violent um, way, you know, into a, le- into a less violent uh, uh, way to express it. And he talks about how it actually it does the opposite of what the football game does in the, in the first part of the chapter. It actually brings the neighborhood together. And he talks about how, you know, there, there are, um, there, there are, uh, drug dealers who, who play alongside everybody else. And there's no judgment. There are, uh, drug cartels that sponsor teams or that make bets on the games. Um, there are, you know, he talks about, uh, somebody who is like a straight A student, who's who plays and someone who just got out of prison who plays and like they're all equal on the court it's like a way of it's it's this non-judgmental zone where everybody can come together and play and um and not always get along perfectly but not resort to violence mm-hmm. um and again it's just it's that that very very stark contrast between this wes and the other wes um mm-hmm. where they're they're in they are in similar situations, but in in with West the author, the neighborhood sport is something that is is painted as very positive, and and a, a very good influence on the neighborhood. And uh, the football game that we see in the other West's section is something that leads to violence and uh, West being arrested. So. Yeah. Um, so, uh, some of, some of the discussion questions in, in addition to the, the study guide questions, um, Tony lectures Wes about taking school seriously and staying off the streets. Um, this says, what advice do you give your siblings based on your experiences? But I mean, thinking about, I mean, we're thinking a long time ago, but thinking back to you and Danny, um, do you remember giving him any advice? about school anything yeah or school or just growing up i mean we were we're both we're both both older siblings that's right yeah yeah um not really i mean like yeah it's been been a long time i i mean it's not just that i don't i mean maybe i've forgotten but i i don't think it's just that i've forgotten i just i don't I don't think we had that kind of relationship. I don't think I ever, I don't think he ever asked me for advice. I don't think I ever gave him advice, at least not about anything like, you know, in terms of like, not, not, uh, yeah. And like, I, I don't remember, I think Danny was an okay student when he mm-hmm. was in school. I don't think he was like a straight A student or anything, but I think he, he always did okay. But I don't recall ever being particularly interested in what his grades were, nor, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Or I, that I'm like, that's, because um, the other thing is, like, I was not in Tony's position because we we had both of our parents, mm-hmm. um, and mom and dad. That was their job to worry yeah. about Danny's grades. Yeah, like my yeah. it wasn't my job. I didn't have to worry about Danny's grades. I was I wasn't in a parental role. Yeah, you know, um, so I didn't feel like I had to. But perhaps if I had been in Tony's spot, you know, where you know maybe like our dad wasn't in the picture and our mom was working all the time and couldn't be as hands-on as she might've been. And I sort of felt like I had to step in and be a little more custodial um, Mm -hmm. than maybe I would have, you know, given him advice or asked him how school was or, you know, checked in on him and made sure that things were okay. Did Um, you guys ever talk about girls? We probably did. I can't remember. I mean, God, God help him if he ever asked me for advice as far as that. Uh, he, 
he was better off on his own as far as that went. I'm like, he could have asked me and I would have been like, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I know that, that that my brothers came to me about that, but that's because, I mean, there's there's a difference there. You know, well, you know, what are girls yeah. like? Give, like, give us some insight. What's the secret um, code? Well, look, I mean, I know technically everybody sees me as a girl, but if I just tell them like books, that's probably not, you know, but, but at the same time, then the, there's that great scene in Beauty and the Beast and there are some people who are like, when he gives her, when, when she, she's amazed, he takes her to the library and she's amazed and he says, do you like it? And she's like, you know, I can't, it's, it's more amazing than anything I ever could have dreamed of. And he says, it's yours. And people are like, oh, she just likes him because he's rich. And I'm like, no, she likes him because he paid attention to what mattered to her. Like that's, I mean, that's so key. Yeah, because you know, so she I'm already going, she already knew he was rich. Yeah, duh, he's got a. It's castle. his castle, yeah, like. Yeah, um, Charles, that's that's the same. But I was more thinking of you know when we were when we were in school when we were in you know Tony's age ish. But apparently, I just can't remember that far back. <laughs> but that you know you're you're talking about Tony Tony taking a custodial role leads into what I have as my next discussion question, which is if Mary held school and education to be so important for herself, if she tried so hard to get her own education, why did she not make sure that her children felt the same way? Essentially, why why isn't she double checking on things, and why right. is Tony feeling like he has to be custodial? That's a good, that's a good question. I mean, because with, um, with Wes, the author, you could say like, well, it's, you know, she's devastated from the death of her husband, mm -hmm. you know, and she's just in a really bad place because of that. But with the other Wes, um, there, it, it's not immediately apparent. I mean, maybe it's, you know, it's just that she's just got, I think the text kind of doesn't say, but it doesn't know. say, no, but she's just got a lot going on. Yeah. You know, she has a lot. I mean, unfortunately, if you're if you are a person living on a low income and you've got kids, uh, you may be in a situation where in order to keep a roof over your head and food on the table, you can't you don't have that. You're not able to pay as close attention to your kids as you would like. And it's doubly so if you're a single parent. Yeah. You know, like she she may just not. I mean, I'm maybe maybe that for all we know, maybe that does cross her mind. Maybe she does worry. Maybe she f has some of the the same concerns about Wes that Tony has. Mm -hmm. But she's, you know, like she's a single mom in Baltimore. She's got shit to do. Yeah. You know? Got to make sure that, 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 that they have some place, you know, with walls and a roof. Yeah. Especially since they've apparently they've been moving around a lot. Mm -hmm. You know? And then the last one is both Wes Moores had absent fathers. Did the way kind of, you know, touching back on the introduction, did the way in which they lost their fathers influence their choices in life? Why or why not? I think they definitely did. Yeah, I think they definitely did. I mean, I, I do think it makes a difference. I, when we talked about this last time, I mean, it makes yeah. the, the fact that um, one of them, well, like, like they, like they mentioned in the, uh, in the interview snippet that we get at the beginning of this section, at the beginning of this part of the book that, you know, if, uh, the other Wes in, in prison says, you know, your dad was taken from you. Your dad died. My dad left by choice. Yeah. You know, and maybe, maybe specifically, like maybe the message that sends is, Hey, you got to take care of yourself. You know, like even if your father is alive and could be part of your life, you can't count on him. The only person you can count on is right here. You need to take care of yourself. And that's kind of the message that Tony gives him, too. It's like, hey, you need to, you know, you can't count on other people looking out for you. You need to look out for yourself. And if somebody fucks with you on the street, you need to fuck with them back. So everybody else knows that they can't do that to you. You have to take care of that. You can't assume that somebody else is going to come and get you. There's actually, there's, there, um, in the, uh, the play, and it, uh, they made a movie of it a couple of years ago with Denzel Washington, uh, Fences. There's yes. a, yeah, there's a great scene that is actually on YouTube. If, if anybody wants to look it up, it's, it's, and it's, it's the, it's, it's, um, the original Broadway cast, which is James Earl Jones and, uh, Courtney B. Vance as the son. I know this. Yeah. Okay. It's such a great scene. And the, 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 the son 
you know, approaches the father and, and basically says, how come you've never liked me? Why don't you like me, dad? And James Earl Jones gets, he, he gets mad, you know, he gets it. He, he, he yells at his son. He says, you know, whoever said I had to like you, you know, it's not my job as your father to like you. It's my job to put a roof over your head and put sheets on your bed and put food in your belly. And I, I do that because that's my job, because it's my responsibility. And, you know, not because I like you, because I because I owe it to you, because you're my son. And, you know, do, do you think that when I go to work that they pay me because they like me? They pay me because they owe me. And 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 he says, you know, you best not worry about whether or not somebody likes you worry about whether or not they're doing right by you. And then there's just a moment at the very end where he softens a little bit. And he says, do you understand what I'm saying to you? And you realize that he's not trying to be abusive. He's trying to drill this into this kid's head because he's worried about him. And he wants to make sure that he will be able to take care of himself and that he will know that, you know, there's more important things in life than people liking you. You need to make sure that people are doing right by you. You need to be able to look out for yourself. And as a father, he feels like his job is to impart that to his son. Um, and that feels very much like the message that the other Wes is getting in a variety of ways. Yeah. Um, you know, that you can't depend on other people. You need to depend on yourself. And the fact that his father, you know, could be a part of his life, but isn't. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to find that scene. Yeah. Because uh, because the one that I give is let me see i'm gonna pull it up here and i'll put the link in chat you know I, you know the one i'm talking about because i know i've told you right oh refresh my memory okay um i don't want to tell you until i have the link ready so hang on okay. but it's a scene is it a scene from fences no it is not a scene okay. from fences okay uh yeah it's this one okay pause and I don't want it 20 seconds dun, dun. So copy uh, that copy and close it now if I just oh no oh I know what this one is you know what I know this what this is? scene is I yeah this is, this is me make this is I make children cry yeah. this is this is the fresh print scene right yes it is yes, yes. Little father leaves so that's yes. the link in chat and it's I mean and it's just it's devastating and we talk about yeah. that and you know um there's a you know and and they have a writing assignment that asks them to contrast um uncle phil and will's dad and it also points out that uncle phil has significantly more money uncle phil is wealthy yeah. how does this play into it um and then um, I, I i talk about the fact that you know people literally i mean and the the the, the meme still goes around that you know um the actor will smith's father you know was an absent figure in his life and that's he pulled on that oh yeah to, to do this scene and that that's actually not true like you know will smith has been in interviews and said no i mean you know i'm my dad is still a part of my you know right. it, he's been a part of my life and that's like I was acting. I was, <laughs> I was acting. acting. That's, that's acting. I'm a really um, good actor. You <laughs> jerks. You know, we don't always get along, but you know, <laughs> I was yeah. acting. And so anyway, but yeah, every time I show that scene in class, dead silence. Yeah. And 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 <laughs> because I'm a I'm I am I am a uh, th there's a part of me that is very sadistic. I judge it success by the number of children who cry, <laughs> <laughs> which is the best you know way to judge you know, how, you know, how effective like, any work of art is. As, as a storyteller, I mean that's just you know laughter like you get for different reasons, you know. But like tears, real honest tears, they're just like it's so sad. Why you know what what do you want me, man? Ah, just, yeah, you, uh, you want to do what Uncle Phil does and give him a hug. But also, I have um, a poem that I want to read for you. Please. If, are you familiar with Those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden? I feel like you might have shared this with me before, but I can't remember it. So please. But please. Your, your, your scene from Fences made me think of that, and I've never connected it with the oh, other great. one. But I've used it in class. It's actually in our 10th grade textbook. Um, and it works just really well together. Awesome. Let's um, hear it. 
Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the, week, in the weekday weather, made bank fire blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him, who had, dri who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? That's good. Um, Charles Chapman asks a, a, an amusing question. How do you pluralize Wes? <laughs> yes. Wes, Wes's, Wes's, um, it is the second one because my rule is, and, and this actually goes against, I think, MLA style, which is that um, names that end in S get apostrophe S to make them plural. I'm like, no, just don't. Um, but um, what I say is, um, I will, I just rephrase it. I, I tell them just like, uh, don't just say avoid it. Yeah. Wes's. Don't say, you know, say each Wes or say both Wes Moore's or say both main characters or, you know, find a different way to structure the sentence that avoids it completely. Because, and, and that's, the, that's the other thing, you know, that's something that I come back to. If you are not completely confident about the way that you, um, we, when we're talking about um, indefinite subject pronouns, especially with um, like each of the birds is singing. Is, is one of my go-to sentences or uh, yeah. So, or each of the pens has ink. That's a little bit more obvious because ink is a collective, but each of the birds sing, you're like, what, you're talking about all the birds, right? You know, multiple birds are singing. So it should be each of the birds are singing. No. No, it's Subject each. Yeah. And each is always singular because you're talking about this bird is singing and that bird is singing and the, that bird is singing and that bird is singing. So one at a right. time, the bird is singing. This bird is singing and you know, it's always so. Um, same and same sort of thing. Just if you're not a hundred percent confident about the structure of your sentence, just change it. You know, if, if you're a sentence, you're like, I don't know how to say this. Well, then say it a different way. Yeah. There you go. Oh, just, just 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 change it. But yeah, I really like that poem. Yeah, and just the imagery in it is really beautiful, and I love the repetition of what did I know in the. And the the you know the implication there, um, but yeah, it yeah. just it's just really nice. And I think you're right; it fits it fits in very well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the end of the chapter. Yep. So, um, what do you now? So next time uh, we're going to discuss a couple more of the. Uh, We'll like and scale questions. I, I honestly, um, I want to go back and look. I haven't, I haven't thought about which two for next time. So just keep your list handy. I don't know. Yeah. So um, yeah, if you have those, bring those back. But yeah. 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 And we'll be, uh, we'll be, so next time and in, in two weeks from tonight, we'll be looking at chapter three. Chapter three. So uh, do your homework, everybody. Do the reading. Those of you who are reading along with us, um, and if you're not, um, please, please come back. Uh, yes, absolutely. Come with us this one. You know, you know that you know, um, and I, I tell my students this. You know, when when we have the opportunity to have in person discussions, that you know, if you haven't had a chance to do the reading, your responsibility, or if you're, you're like literally, I've had students come in as we're you know finishing discussion about the book. That your 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 responsibility is to ask questions that get other people to explain what's going on. Your responsibility is to talk to them and, and help them help you understand because this allows you, first of all, it allows you to figure out what the heck's going on. Second, <laughs> it allows them to um, explain their ideas. Um, it, right. it, you're giving them the opportunity to demonstrate what they know as well as to demonstrate good communication skills, you know, to check your understanding, things like that. You know, you can provide, you know, you can provide something valuable to this conversation by asking good questions and following up with, wait, that didn't make sense. Can you tell me more about this and such? So yeah, even if you don't get a chance or if you have, if you have the book and you don't get to read it, that's okay. It's, it's okay. okay. Well, and, and also because, I mean, 
you know, as we've just as we've demonstrated tonight, I mean, the, the, the book raises questions that mm -hmm. you might be interested in talking about and, and will be able to talk about and contribute to in a meaningful way, even if you haven't read the book, because we're talking about stuff like, you know, how our choices affect our lives and circumstances in the inner city. And, you know, we were talking a lot tonight about education, education and, and educa you know, going yeah. through the public education system. And like the, yeah, it, 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 the book in it, in when you read it, it invites you to consider these things and to think about these things and to ask these questions. And, um, you know, so even if you haven't read it, we have, so we're going to talk about it and you can I'll tell you what I think. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I'll now never hold back on that. That's yeah, sure. no, you, that's one thing everybody can rely can, on. can rely on. Exactly, Dana will tell you what is on her mind. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you uh, you had a video just go up uh, yesterday on your vi on your YouTube channel, which was your most recent Pride and Prejudice video that you mentioned a little bit earlier. Oh, I got um, two more weeks before I got to do another one. Thank you. Uh, you're, <laughs> um, so anybody who is not subscribed to Dana on YouTube, please do so. It's youtube.com slash- Leave comments. Comments, yes. comments, comments. YouTube.com slash Dana Coldares, which some random geek just dropped in the chat. Thank you very much, my friend. And um, also let's not forget about- The charity links. Absolutely, charitylinks.page. Uh, check out those. Those are, again, uh, for some friends of ours who are in financial distress, who need a, a helping hand as far as that goes. There are some PayPal links and fundraisers and also uh, legal defense funds that Some Random Geek has put in there. And Some Random Geek is, is uh, who compiled that and curated that, that list. You click the link and it takes you to a Google Doc with all of these other links. So if you have a few bucks to spare and you want to help somebody out, uh, check out the charity links. The, that Those are uh, a great way to... Uh, um, help someone know, personally. Help somebody out. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, don't forget, you can help my channel out and help me out by either becoming a patron by going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives, or now you can also uh, join the channel as a member for either a dollar a month, uh, $5 a month, or $10 a month to support the channel in that way. Uh, either way is fine with me. People say, which is better for you? Like, if you are already a patron, you can stay a patron you don't have to drop that and become a channel member if you aren't either one and it's easier for you to just click the join button and become a channel member that's great do that if you'd rather become a patron do that instead like it's it's e either either version of support i am so so grateful and happy to have and i could not do this without the support that i get from patrons and or members uh so either one is great and i'm thankful for it um and uh we will be back on wednesday to watch the last episode of firefly yes which is I objects in space watching, uh we'll, we'll still flip off with uh, ds9 but then we will be watching serenity the movie the movie and then we'll be the big, the big yeah. damn movie the big damn movie. So that, yeah. So, so, so that's on Wednesday. We're watching objects in space, the last episode of firefly. Um, and then I will be back a week from tonight with, uh, my next, uh, ask away Q and a stream also on Wednesday next week will be another star Trek video. It'll be the comment response, uh, the most recent comment response video, um, which I shot, uh, yesterday and have been editing a little bit today. And that'll be a good one. Actually, I, uh, I, Dana, I told you about this earlier. I, when I, when I, but when you looked at how much it was, you were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, my, I mean, to use a, uh, to, to use a, 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 a movie term, uh, my assembly cut was almost an hour and a half long. Um, I have whittled it down to under an hour. And, uh, will there I, be further whittling, Steve? There prop there, there may be, yes, there may be, but as of, as of now, it is under an hour. And, uh, I, I accomplished that by just cutting out a whole bunch of comments. Uh, it's actually- So right now I kind of hate you a little. <laughs> it's actually really easy when, when, the, uh, when the design of the video is inherently modular, it's like, you know, okay, I'll just get rid of this one. <laughs> you know, and get rid of this one. And before you know it, you I've had to- so many comments and you can just like get rid of them. And like in your, in your response and I'm just like, I'm like checking. I'm like, okay, no new comments yet. No checking. No new comments yet. <gasps> Somebody left me a comment. I like this video. <gasps> I left a comment. Yay! <laughs> I mean, it's 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 sad, really. I'm like, I think this might be spam. 
but you make very interesting points in this. <laughs> very interesting points, spammer. I'm like, how? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's sad. Thank you for the comment. So yes, yeah, but yeah, so yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna subscribe to Dana's channel and watch her awesome, excellent videos, please, please do leave a comment as well. Because as you can see, she's desperate. <laughs> I don't think they can see because I did that while you were talking. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was like, please, 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 please. It's silly. Yeah. I realize that's silly. And yet, and yet. <laughs> and yet. Um, so, uh. yeah, uh, that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, this discussion of chapter two of the other Westmore. We'll see you in two weeks for chapter three and, and we'll see you on Wednesday for Trek Reluctantly. Thanks so, so much for coming by folks and for talking with us. Yep. Thanks for watching everybody. Take care. Have a good weekend. Yeah.